Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you all for joining together for that wonderful song. Yeah. Which I will not repeat. For our guest of honor. For our guest of honor. That's right. So we are uh, we are continuing our long and exciting, enduring journey so many words, through Revelation. Uh, there's a lot to cover. We have already covered quite a bit. We've got about 11 chapters under our belt so far, and uh, we're well on our way to continuing through the exciting events that happen. Right now, we're in the midst of really uh, the efforts of the Great Tribulation. There's a lot of activity happening during this time. We're in actually chapter 12, and this morning I thought we would actually together read chapter 12, and then we'll unpack a lot of what's happening there, because there's a lot of imagery. There's a lot happening from the narrative. We're introduced to some important persons in the tribulation, some people that are of note, people that are going to be important uh, characters as we work through the rest of the uh, chapters of, of, of uh, Revelations here. So uh, without any further ado, let's go ahead and start off in chapter 12, verse 1. And it's a, it's a short, short chapter, so uh, bear with us here. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept away a third of the stars out of the sky, bless you, flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, so that he might devour her child in the moment it was born. It didn't happen, guys, just so you know. If you're worried, like if my kids are reading and they're nervous, it didn't happen, don't worry. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God into his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days, which, uh, quick math, that's three and a half years. And now we're introduced to the archangel Michael. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon uh, and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and, and his angels with him. Then heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now I have come... Now have come the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ for, his, for the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our, our God day and night has been hurled down. They overcome him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They, they did not love their life so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He's filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. So this is, remember we talked last week how we're going to do some pretty intense time travel. I'll explain what happened there in just a minute. That's a, uh, a reference to what had already taken place and why the enemy of our souls is dwelling here on the earth. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert, where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and a half time out of the serpent's reach. I know that's a very specific measure of time. Uh, theologians uh, characterize that as about three and a half years. Then from the, the mouth of the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with, with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of, the, uh, out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Right? There's a lot just to happen there. So we're going we're gonna to do our best to explain it at a high level to understand what we just read and what is happening and where we are all at in the midst of, of these activities uh, that are taking place. So again, uh, there's a, uh, uh, it's a well-accepted theology that uh, this is happening post-rapture, meaning that the church is probably exited from the, from the earth at this time, and this is happening to the remaining uh, dwelling of the world, which would be the, uh, the Jewish people, uh, specifically those who would then become the Messianic Jews, those who are then uh, later converts of accepting, oh, Jesus was in fact the Savior, right? And so we have this picture of these people enduring this great suffering. However, we also have a picture of explaining what happened in heaven however many years ago. Right? It doesn't say if it was a thousand years ago, ten thousand, ten million years ago. We don't know the exact timeline. It doesn't tell us that. That's okay. That's not important to the story. What's important is that it did happen and we're left in the aftermath of that battle. 
And so as you look at the first couple of verses here, uh, we have the woman clothed with the sun, right? That represents Israel, right? So a lot of people would think, oh, it's like, oh that's Mary. It's like, well, it technically it represents Israel. And the red dragon representing Satan prepares to devour her child. The child symbolizing Jesus is born and caught up to God's throne while the woman flees into the wilderness. So that's the picture of what we just read here when it talks about the, the woman being pregnant and the woman and the person trying to be snatched up and you know, so certainly we have uh, a lot to cover there. But what I want to do is introduce you to some of the characters uh, that we're going to see, some of the important figures, some of the persons of the Great Tribulation. So we have the woman who is representing Israel. We have the dragon representing Satan. Not really a stretch there, right? We understand that to be pretty easy to, to follow along. The man-child, the fully man, fully God, uh, referring to Jesus. Uh, the angel Michael, head of the angelic host, which is really cool, by the way, because Michael is not spoken of a lot. He's certainly spoken spoken about, you know, in, uh, you know, modern uh, literature and things like that. It talks about the Archangel Michael, right? Because he's, he's probably the most powerful angel that there is. He's, he's an intense uh, celestial being, so it's, it's neat to learn about and talk about him. Uh, but important also not to put too much emphasis on it, that we begin to be drawn to him as the thing. And he's not the thing. He's a creation of God, which is the main thing. So important that we keep that in mind. Uh, the offspring of the woman, representing the Gentiles who come to faith in the tribulation. The beast out of the sea representing the Antichrist. We'll get to that later. And the beast out of the earth representing the false prophet who promotes the Antichrist. And so we have all these things, these activities that are happening that are consistent with not only the, uh, uh, the discovery of, but the fulfillment of prophecy going as far back as Joseph's dream uh, way back when, when he had this, this picture that would take place. Do I have this one up here? I do. Okay. So Genesis 37, 9 through 11 reads like this. It says, In that dream, the sun represents, rep, rep, represented Jacob. The moon represents Joseph's mother, Rachel, and the 11 stars are the sons of Israel. So it says, Then he had another dream, and he told his brothers, Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and the 11 star, stars were bowing down to me. We, we know the stars were the 11 other tribes of Israel. We know that the sun and the moon uh, were uh, aspects of the, uh, the people of Israel. And ultimately, this is the fulfillment of Scripture, as we see in Revelations here, in this moment where it's caught up and explained further. And poor John. Can you imagine him writing this down on the island of Patmos? So you're trying to keep up. So much is happening, right? Now, in the dream, again, Joseph, uh, the sun represented Jacob. The moon represents Joseph's mother, Rachel. Eleven stars are the sons of Israel, which bowed down to Joseph. It's a sign of the twelve stars. Joseph is now among the other tribes of Israel. The childbirth pain specifically, as you look at that, is undoubtedly specifically accurate. Uh, as we know, the childbirth, well, I don't know personally that it's, it's painful, but I've, I've heard it's not uncomfortable, not a good time, right? Um, but we understand that that is a painful thing, but it also uh, implies further implications uh, with Jesus being born when the people of Israel were occupied under Roman control, right? So we have this picture of this great birth happening during a time of great suffering. So from that time of great suffering, under the Roman occupation comes forth Jesus, who is the Savior of all, right? Jews and Gentiles alike. Now, devouring the child, I always used to read that and think, huh, that's, that's terrifying in every way imaginable. And you're right, it is. Uh, uh, but again, it's a picture of what was attempting to happen. If you remember early on in the, the Christmas story, right, shortly, about a week or so after we do the Christmas story, or depending on, you know, how, how you know, uh, aggressive we're feeling during that time, we'll talk about Herod and what he was trying to do during that time. He learned that there was the great king that was born in the land, so he does the only thing natural to a dictator of that time. He demands that all children, all, all boy children under the age of two uh, would be uh, killed. And so that was this, this effort to devour or to destroy the child, uh, knowing that it was a great threat to him and ultimately to uh, all of the rulers and principalities of the known world. There's a lot happening there. So in Psalm 5, we see this also, it talks about the iron scepter. And again, this is just verses 1 through 6 here. The iron scepter, this is not an uncommon picture. We see this throughout scripture. Uh, one specifically is Psalms 2.9. Um, oops. I'm just going to read it to you. Psalm 2, 9, you will break them with a rod of iron and you will dash them to pieces like pottery. So it's a picture of ruling. It's a picture of a great authority. Whenever we see an iron scepter, it's not meant to be a lightly wielded, you know, cast iron pan. You're making some eggs for breakfast. Not like that. It's good for you. But this is picturing a giant iron scepter that's meant to rule, conquer, destroy. It's not, it's not a lightly imaged item there. You guys keeping up? There's a lot happening so far. I know we're going fast. 
I'm, I'm proud of all of you. This <laughs> is not easy. Uh, going further into verses 7 through 12, we want to talk about the war in heaven. Remember reading this as a kid thinking, this is really cool. Like, this is, this is like, okay, this is where it gets exciting, right? Like, cinematically, can you imagine how this would be poured out? All of the wages of heaven and all of their angelic hosts and all of the, the demonic armies of Satan and everyone trying to fight for the, the power struggle. And, and we know that uh, Michael and his army ultimately was successful in defeating uh, the enemy, uh, Satan, or Lucifer, as he was formerly known, um, before he rebranded as Satan. And so the important thing about him and about Michael is oftentimes people make the very grave mistake of comparing Satan as God's equal counterpart. Let me be really clear. Nothing could be further from the truth. Satan is not the equal opposite threat to God. There is no threat to God. God is not in danger. God is not going to be overcome by this created being that he himself created, who then chose himself over uh, relationship with God. So it's important. If there is any comparison to be made here of a one-for-one, one, who is likely Satan's actual one-to-one -one enemy? Like, who could probably, like, if we had a fist fight, where would it actually be challenging? Right? If it was God, he would just look at it, and it would be over. He'd be, he'd be eviscerated into dust, right? But, he's, you know, if, if they were to do one-on-one -on -one battle, it'd be Michael. Michael is the only other created angelic being referred to in Scripture that went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan and won. Right, we see pictures all throughout um, uh, Scripture. There's battling, and there's just you know we can't beat him. We're gonna we're gonna fall back. Gabriel was like, can't do it. Got to fall back. You know, God, this one's on you. Um, Michael uh, actually had the strength and the ability, and was given the power to defeat him. So as you read through this war, it's important to know that Michael. Uh, had that, uh, that gift or that, um, that victory handed over to him. And so we look at this, right? We know that he's cast out. We know that Satan is defeated and thrown down to earth. Heaven rejoices, but woe is pronounced to the earth because of the devil's wrath. The first time you realize, you, you might be thinking, oh, this is where Satan loses. And you're like, oh, wait, no, this is where we suffer because Satan is dwelling among the earth, right? Because this is a picture of the enemy of our soul dwelling and inhabiting the world that we live in today, uh, fighting for our souls, trying to convince us that we're the most important person in the world and we need to look out for ourselves. We need to live out our best truth. We need to do all the things that are self-satisfying, self-ingratiating, because that keeps our focus on the real thing, which is service and love and obedience to a Heavenly Father who loves us more than we could possibly imagine, right? His job is to keep us distracted. And man, he is, he's been largely uh, successful in many areas, and uh, certainly we know that it's temporary, right? It's a battle. The war is already won. Right. I want to keep that in mind as we keep focus on here. Love that song we just right, we, we, we just sang a minute ago. Uh, you know, the battle's already won. The victory is already God's. Right. So Satan is just hanging out on the battlefield, trying to do as much damage, trying to take down as many ships with him as he can as they uh, go back to. Uh, the homeland. So, uh, war breaks out in heaven. We have this. Um, this is where the turn. This is where the tide really turns against Satan. And, and you can only imagine, right? We understand that God is a God of grace. He's a God of compassion. God of love. But also, a God of justice. Right? He's not going to sit in the way of wrongdoing. And so, I have to imagine how much time did Satan have before God said, "Enough is enough." Right? Was it the first time? Was it the second time? We don't know. Scripture is unclear. But we do know that if this was the outcome, it had to have been very bad on Satan's part. So as we continue on here, the dragon represents Satan, as we know, in 12.9. And Satan is not the counterpart of God, which we just talked about. Right? We know that Michael, who is chief of the fallen angels, is likely the counterpart. Uh, Satan does not even hold a candle against the eternal furnace that is God. I just want to be really clear, because the modern society say, oh, it's God versus the devil. That's not a fight. That's not even a thing. The devil is nothing compared to God. So I just want to make that abundantly clear. If we walk away with nothing else today, let that be top of mind for all of us. So when is this battle fought? That's the question, right? We don't really know, right? We know it occurs some point in the, the mid-year uh, seven period, uh, as described by Daniel, right? Or it occurs in eternal history or eternal forward. It doesn't really matter when, so let's not focus exactly when that's happening. But we do know at that time, uh, Michael, the great prince of the angels at the time, uh, protects the people and he, and he arises. He shows up. So even now, today, even though he's cast out of heaven, there's still an angelic host fighting 
on our behalf. Right? We have God, obviously. He is our ultimate ruler in salvation, and we love Him, and He absolutely has us. But there is a constant battle. Um, and it's not that God can't handle it all at once, and He needs Him to help. It's more that He loves us so much. He wants us to know that we are well covered. So even when things seem impossible, He has a whole army of angels also interceding on our behalf as well. And so we see here that this is a time of great distress in the midst of this tribulation here, right? Um, there, is, there is going to be a time that is uh, worse than any time seen in, in past history. And we see this is originally alluded to in uh, Daniel 12, 11 here, which is another apocalyptic, verse, uh, it's apocalyptic uh, book in the Bible, just a story of the end times. And what's to come? At the, at the time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will rise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of the nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone who na whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. So this is a picture of urgency. It's a picture of we know it's hard. We know that there's going to be suffering. We, we, we may know that you also may even lose your physical life in the midst of it. However, we have, we have intercessors. See to it that your name is written in the eternal book here. Continuing on here, there's, there's four different falls in Scripture that are really detailed for Satan. Um, and so I just want to take a quick look at those. And again, I don't like to take a lot of time on Sundays talking about the enemy of our souls. But it's important to understand him. It's worse if we ignore him because then it basically says, it's like, well, if I don't think about it, it's not a problem. No, we have to be aware. right? We have to be uh, on guard. And we have to put all of our energy and focus on God. But we have to understand you know, uh, that, that we are not uh, going through uh, without challenges. So we have the first fall, which is... A glorified position in heaven to a, um, a bit of a profane uh, fall here. And that reference is incorrect. It's not Daniel. It's Ezekiel 28, 14 through 16. I'll correct that before I send it to you. You are anointed as guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You are on the holy mount of God, and you walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Though through your widespread trade you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. So this right here reads like the lament of a father, right? You know, obviously God is detailing what took place. You went against me. I tried and you fought against me and I had to cast you out because your evil has no place in this holy dwelling. So that's the first time. So from a glorified position, right, to a fallen position. Uh, we also know that the enemy had access to heaven and still has access to heaven. Doesn't mean he's dwelling in heaven, but he can talk to those in heaven, right? And he has, he has their direct line from having access. So he talks about it in Job 1.12. It says that the Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has in your power, but the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Went out from the presence of the Lord. Well, the only way you can be in the presence of the Lord is if, is if you have access to where he dwells, right? And this is a picture of uh, Satan saying, I know you think Job is so great. What if I torture him for a while? Wouldn't that be great? Let's see if he's still great. And so that's where that story comes from. We see it again in 1 Kings. Um, 22 through 20, or 22, 21, it says, Finally a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord, and said, I will entice him. This is a picture of trying to entice Saul to further his arrogance and get him to continue sinning away from him because he knew that he had already uh, began to live in such a way that said, I know better than you, God. Right? So he was asking, who, who, who dares uh, to uh, invite him to continue to sin against me? And uh, certainly we know that the enemy was eager to raise his hand. I will. I'm happy to cause him to sin further. And we see in Zechariah 3, 1, here where it says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan is standing at his right side to accuse him. Right? So this is a, a constant picture of this guy hanging out, always in the sides, trying to uh, make God know and remind God how awful we've been. So fortunately, we have a great attorney. It's Jesus, right? So just keep that in mind as we move forward here. So Revelations 22 here. It says this, from earth to bondage, right? From the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Another fall here. This is more of a permanent fall here. He sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil, Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. This is the millennium. We'll talk about that later. And then lastly, this is the last fall of Satan that we'll finally see here. And this is in Revelation 20.10 here. And it says, that from the pit to the lake of fire... And the devil who deceived them, who was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown, will be tormented day and night forever and ever. It's bleak. It's not a good time, right? So this is a picture of what happens to uh, the, the enemy, right? 
Let me see it one last time in Luke 10, 18 here where Jesus is talking. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So there's this constant picture of, here's this created being, had everything at his disposal. He had power, purpose, authority, beauty, arguably, right? All the things that would be um, uh, necessary to find great purpose, right? But it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. He wanted to, he himself, be God. And it, maybe if he didn't say that verbatim, say, I want to be God, he lived his life in such a way that said, I think my way is better than your way. And that arrogance, that blaspheme, is what ultimately caused him to be cast out indefinitely, right? So this refers uh, back to this first fall of the enemy. All right, last couple of chunks here, verses 13 through 17. We have the dragon persecutes the woman. What does that mean, right? So the woman gave birth to the male child. She's given wings to escape, and, and the earth helps her by swallowing the river. The dragon spews from his mouth. In rage, the dragon goes off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Now, some would teach, um, and some, you know, some uh, thinking that the woman is a symbol representing all of the people of God, including faithful Israel and the church. Uh, they, this is typically used as a mechanism to advance the idea that this uh, tribulation is happening during the church period. Um, however, if the woman represents the people of all the people of God, the church and the faithful Israel, then who are the rest of the offspring described in Revelations 12, 17, right? That's really more of just a, a thought nugget for you to, to think about for the rest of the day. You don't have to solve it. I'm just getting you to think about it more <laughs> holistically here. It's better to see her as Israel in general or Messianic Jews in particular. Now, verse 17 here uh, talks about this. Either continues, when we read 17, just to remind all of us, what did it say here? Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring who was to obey God's commandments and hold testimony of Jesus. So this continues the fierce persecution of all of those who would submit to and worship uh, this great uh, satanic dictator, which we read about later. And the martyrs of this period are, are revealed in Revelation 6, 9, and 7 uh, earlier on here. So it's, it's an interesting um, pieces of information here. And I know that we've covered a lot, but the important takeaways for us today, did I do a summary? I did do a summary. I'm so glad because I got lost too. All right, so here's what we're looking at from today. All right, there's a lot happening. And I did this for both me and for you because there's a lot. Uh, so let's, let's run down here. So we have the woman and the dragon, right? A woman clothed with the sun representing Israel is threatened by a red dragon symbolizing Satan who seeks to devour her child. The child. Uh, the woman gives birth to a male child who is destined to rule all the nations and is caught up to God's throne representing Jesus Christ. War in heaven. So cool. Michael and his angels battle the dragon and his angels. The dragon is defeated and cast down to earth. Persecution on earth. The dragon persecutes the woman, but she is given two wings like an eagle to escape into the wilderness. Now, some folks will look at this as a, an actual like uh, removal of uh, key uh, players or key folks within the Israel uh, community that, as like a helicopter, like legit wings, like getting you out of Dodge, right? So um, the scripture doesn't mention, you know, Blackhawks. So we can't make that assumption. Um, we have then, lastly, the dragon's wrath. Uh, enraged by his defeat, the dragon goes off to make war against the rest of the woman's offspring. That's using Gentiles. That's us guys. Sorry. Uh, representing the faithful believers. So that's that's everything for today. Very exciting, right? Uh, but the takeaway for this, and I was reading through just different uh, scripture on this, different uh, authors and commentaries, people way smarter than me who have spent their whole life to trying to understand eschatology and revelations and trying to understand all of the huge and important things. But there's one that came across I wanted to share with you guys this morning. It was really a, uh, a reminder for us. If ever you're feeling like you're being persecuted or you're enduring great suffering, you're like, why is this happening to me? That's a good indicator that you might be doing something right. Right? And I love this, this quote here. It says, It is precisely when Satan has lost the battle for the souls of saints in heaven that he begins the fruitless persecution of their bodies. Right? He knows he's lost. All he has left is to cause physical pain, physical discomfort, financial uncertainty, all of the things that um, are the most tangible things that are in front of us and are easy to focus on because they're in our immediate physical experience. But we are to be reminded that we are not a, uh, a creature that's only here for a short time. We are eternal beings with a flesh suit on. Right? We're just hanging out for a little bit. We are eternal. And this eternal life is going to exist either in concert and in joy with Jesus, our Savior, in, in perfect harmony with God, or it's going to be living forever, dying every day for the rest of eternity. 
I, for one, am not in favor of the latter. So if ever there's a question of where you stand or where your friends stand or where they might stand, I would encourage you maybe not to read the Mall of Revelations as an opening line, uh, but encourage them to understand that, hey, I have a faith system that represents my eternal self. I know I'm going to be here forever. Right? I know that my, uh, my physical body is not going to, but I know that I, as a created being, have been given purpose by a creator. So I want to think about that as we close this morning, guys. Daily Father, thank you so much for your word this morning and the uh, wonderful pieces of imagery that, uh, albeit challenging at times to understand and to comprehend and to absorb, I pray that you would just nurture our heart and that our spirit would be willing to be eager to understand it, that we would have a heart of, of, um, of, of peace and of humility and that we would do our best to not only understand your word, but to, to live out the wonderful things that you've asked us to do by following your commands, to love one another. And we know that this is a, uh, a, a, an enormous ask, but the fruit is enormously and permanently uh, beautiful and giving and eternal and full of joy. So we know that you've given us everything. And all we have to do is cooperate with your spirit of truth and know that uh, you sent your son because you love us. And we have great um, opportunity because of what he's done for us on Calvary. We know that we have a great capacity for forgiveness that we didn't have before we were born again. We have a great capacity for understanding, a great capacity for compassion and for joy that was untapped, unmet, unreached until we understood what relationship with you was like. So Lord, I hope that we would be reminded of what it means to be in relationship with you and all the fruit that truly comes from that, all the joy that comes from that. So I pray that it, you would help us as a, as a church, as a body of believers, as individuals, as, you, as we continue to study this, this, this book of Revelations, Lord, that you would uh, inspire us, that you would write on our hearts great understanding and that we would continue to work through this in a way that is uh, pleasing to you and to, to nurture uh, the furthering of our souls. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.